Welcome back again. So this is what we started doing in the last class. Trying to solve the circuit and find its thevenin's equivalent in the frequency domain. In the um, complex number format. Okay. So given a, a circuit like this, we followed the steps of setting up equations using KCL and then of course using a constraint equation massaging them together to beat out the value for V thevenin. Okay, eventually we got a value for V thevenin to be the way that pi. Okay, 10 angle 45. That was the first part. The second part was to find the Z thevenin or the impedance looking in to the circuit. And we do that by applying a test voltage test current. And by deactivating the independent current source. Once we do that, once we deactivate the independent current source, we are left with a simple parallel combination of resistor and capacitor. The equivalent of that can be found to be this value, five minus J5. Hence we have the Timlin's equivalent circuit. Okay, so this is what we did in the last class. And along the process, along this step, uh, well, so we found out, we, we used the uh, conversion process, how to convert from time domain to, to complex numbers, how to convert from time domain to phasor, phasor to rectangular, rectangular to phasor or polar form, okay? We did that back and forth conversion. Multiplication is always easy in phasor domain or polar form. Addition is always easy in complex number form, which is rectangular form. Okay, let's see if we can do one more example. We'll move on to the last chapter, chapter number 10. Chapter number 10 is an easy chapter. I'll probably not solve many example problems in that, I just go over the basic concept because it's a pretty straightforward chap. Okay. So here is an op amp, and you expect this is another example problem that we want to solve. Op amps in frequency domain. This is as crazy as it can get, right? Op amps initially um, until the until we saw this chapter, chapter number nine, some of you might have thought that op amps was a difficult chapter. But now this is as difficult or as complicated as it can get in this course, which is using op amps and frequency domain. But you'll see that if you stick to the first principles, the basics, just the pure basics, it'll get you through. Very simple idea. Okay, so the question is find the output, look at the output voltage VO. Okay, VO, which is this guy, the voltage across that guy. Find the voltage across that guy, it's time domain expression. How do we do that? We apply the two rules. Yes, we apply the two rules for the op amp. Try to get the value for the current, that IL. Okay, once we have IL, we should have V0. Once we have V0, we should be able to write V0 of T, V output 
of t time domain expression okay so that's the process and in order to do that we have to apply the um, two rules we may find that if we are careful in applying if we are smart in applying the two rules we don't even have to find il we can directly find the value of v naught okay if we are um, if we are careful if we are smart in applying our kvl and kcl rules so let's see let me label the nodes first i'm going to call that as va okay, let me call that node as node A, and the voltage at that node will be VA. Okay, what would be the voltage at this guy? What would be the voltage at that node? Um, VN, um, I would call it VN. Sure, sure. VN, VN. Can we apply any rules directly on this? Um, what was that? Apply any what? Any rules? There were two rules, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we can. So um, the voltage on the positive terminal is zero. So VN is zero. Thank you. VN is zero. So this is as good as a ground, virtual ground. This is the virtual ground rule, right? Rule number one. If the positive terminal is tied to ground, the negative terminal is also tied to the ground. Okay? And I'm going to simply apply that without making a fuss or without making a big deal about it. Just, you know, I just name this guy as ground as well because that's rule number one. Okay? Silently, I begin by making that observation. Okay, then let's see if I can identify three branch currents because I want to apply. So here is, let me begin my solution. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is to do KCL at node VA. KCL at node VA. So if I'm looking at node VA, which is this purple guy, let me identify the currents flowing in there. There is one current, I'll call it simply as I1, going west. There is one, there's another current, okay? This guy, I2, going south. And then of course there is I3, going east and then you can call this guy as i4 okay the current going north is i4 okay let's carefully color code them i'm going to probably let's see try as much as i can to use these colors there's one color current going over there there's another current going in the south, okay? Let's see if I can use this color for the current going north, okay? And then there's one color current going, okay? Hopefully, these are the only colors that work in the black background and also on the white um, figure, so I have to be careful, okay? So when we are writing the KCL at, uh, this note, I1, what's the value of I1? So the KCL is I1 plus I2 plus I3 plus I4, all of that equals to zero is the KCL. Okay, I1, that's the one shown in purple, is negative to angle zero degrees it's in phasor form okay plus what's the current 
going south. The current going south would be, if you think about it, okay, current going south would be VA, the voltage at that node, minus zero, that's the voltage on the other side of the capacitor over its impedance, J 10K. Okay, so this is what I'm doing. I'm looking at the capacitor here. I want to find the current through this. What's the voltage there? It's VA, so let me use a different color. The voltage there is VA minus the voltage here is zero over the ZL, okay? That gives me the current uh, through the capacitor, okay? Similarly, let's, uh, what's the current going through the 20 kilo ohm resistance? That'll be VA, this voltage, minus this voltage over 20 kilo ohms. So if I were to write the blue or the cyan equation here, I3 would be VA minus zero over 20 kilo ohms, right? That's I3. And then there is of course I4, which is going north, okay? I4 is going to be VA minus VO over 100 kilo ohms. All of that equals to zero. So V I4 I is, yes ma'am, I4 is this voltage minus this voltage over 100 kilo ohms. Yes. Do we need to account for the five kilo ohms in I1? Five kilo ohms in I1. With the um, with the phasor voltage, so it's um, two magnitude it's a good two. It's a good question. Yes, yes. I'm sorry, my bad. That's a very sharp observation. I thought of this as a current value. Okay. So really, what I'm going to have to do is let's say that's a mistake. So V A minus two angle zero volts over five kilo ohms. You're right, okay? So that's how we, we would account for, because this is a voltage source. I, I read that to be an appearance and then directly use its value, okay? So thank you for finding that. Good observation. Okay, other questions, please. So I can simplify this equation, okay? I can simplify this equation and write it as, uh, let's see, let me use this color here, okay? When I simplify this equation, I'm going to get 26 minus J10, J10 VA minus VO, where O is the output, all of that equals to 40. Okay, this is one equation. Okay, this is the equation one that we get by writing KCL at node VA. Okay, but then we can write KCL at node VN as well. Let me see if I can copy this guy. Copy this guy, paste it over here. So I have two unknowns here. The two unknowns I have are VA and VO. So I would need one more equation, okay? Let's see, let me get my figure back right here. And then I'm going to write KCL at this node, okay? KCL at VN, okay? KCL at VN, for which I'm going to have to do this guy, okay? Sorry about that. So KCL at that node, okay? 
So let's see if we can write the case here like this note and identify the currents that are going in. This has a simpler manifestation. There are just two currents going. One current going left, okay? One current going north and then eastward. You could name these currents as I5 and I6, but you could do away without even naming them because there are just two of those. But of course, we do know for a fact that this voltage is VA, right? That guy is VA. Okay. And guy is VA. So let's set up KCL at uh, Set up KCL at node VN, I5 plus I6, all of that equals zero. That's the KCL equation. What's I5? I5, and I'm not going to color code this because there are just two. Okay, you keep it simple. VN minus VA over 20 kilo ohms plus VN minus VO over negative J 100K. All of that should zero, okay? And we know for a fact that VN is zero, okay? Let's see, VN is zero, okay? So we'll be left with an equation that looks like this. Negative VA, by 20K, negative VO by J100K, positive, because there's a negative in the denominator as well. All of that equals to zero. Simplify this equation, okay? You'll get it in the form, it appears like so, okay? J5 VA minus V naught equals to zero. Okay, so this is the second equation. So we have two equations now. And of course I have not shown this part explicitly, right? How do you convert this from the phase of form? to the rectangular form or, or uh, you don't have to convert this to rectangular form until you are doing addition. If you're doing addition, you definitely have to convert this to rectangular form because you cannot, it's not convenient to do your additions in the phase of form, okay? Okay, so we have two equations. One is this guy. I'll do this. Paste it over here. Two equations. Solve them together. You'll get an expression for VO. Okay, VO. Let's see. Let me write it like so. VO is. 1.43 plus j 7.42 okay if you represent that in phase of form 1.43 squared plus 7.42 squared under root of that will be your magnitude okay you're trying to represent that in a angle phi form, okay? And your phi is going to be tan inwards, imaginary part over the real part, okay? So you'll be left with VO equals to 7.56 angle 79.9 
which is pretty easy to convert to time domain v o of t is 7.56 cosine omega t cosine omega t plus 79 point. So this is supposed to be 79.09 degrees. 79.09 degrees volts. So that will be your answer. Questions, please. Okay, you wanted to find the, you were asked to find the time domain expression. There you have it. That's the time domain expression for the output voltage. So we did not even have to go through the process of finding IL because I set up my equations in terms of, I set up my equations in terms of uh, VA and VO as the independent variables. Questions, please. Okay, so that will that be the that will be the last problem I want to do in terms of uh, in in chapter nine. Okay, um, I hope I have been able to give you uh, I have been able to give you enough exposure to the um, to the enough number of a variety of problems. Okay. Let's. Uh, stop there and um, we'll not be talking about mutual inductance and other um, concepts uh, because the semester is short in a regular um, semester fall or spring semester maybe we would have had time to go over this but uh, this will not be on your exam so you don't have to worry about this for the summer semester okay we'll start with this guy let's see if i can We'll start with steady state power calculations, a very important, a very interesting concept. Okay, power calculations. Questions, please. Questions before we move on. Right. So, this is the last chapter, and not many. Not a very tricky chapter. It's just a um, straightforward chapter, and I'm not going to solve many problems on paper. I'll walk you through some examples, time permitting, but that will be it. Okay. Nearly all electric energy is currently supplied in the form of sinusoidal voltages and currents. See the tool set that we developed in the last chapter, steady state sinusoidal analysis is going to come in handy from here on out, okay? So, um, because all the power is supplied to residential um, and of course industrial use in sinusoidal form, okay? We'll be talking about different manifestations, different kinds of um, definition, different definitions for power. What is average power, reactive power, complex power, the apparent power. So I'm going to give you the definitions for these as we go along. Let's look at the instantaneous power first. Okay. We always um, calculate power in accordance with the passive sign convention, meaning that if the, you know, passive sign convention, this is one of the very first 
topics that we discussed, when very first techniques I gave you, if the current flow is along the voltage drop, then the current is positive. If the current flow is opposite to the voltage drop, then that, that current flow is negative. That's what we discussed, okay? Now, the instantaneous power is the power at any given moment. When it, when it comes to the sinus, you, you know power is V times I, voltage times current. So when you have two sinusoids, let's say um, your voltage is this guy, okay? Let's say that's your voltage and your current is this guy, okay? Let's say your current is this guy. Okay, voltage times current gives you uh, power. Power is V times I. Where you see, if voltage has a phase angle of phi, voltage has a phase angle of theta V, and current has a phase angle of theta I. Okay, now it's a matter of simplification. That's it. Nothing else. Trigonometric identities. We use different trigonometric identities. So we are going to do this. V cos theta times I cos omega t plus theta I. So two different cosines, V times I. Okay, what I'm going to do is to um, cos theta cos A, cos B, okay? There's a cos A, cos B trigonometric identity, um, cos, which can be expressed in terms of cos A plus B cos A, cosine A minus B, okay? So cosine omega theta minus theta I, I cosine omega T plus theta I minus theta I, okay? So um, all I have done, is to simply phase shift. The power is still going to be the same. The phase shift, both of these terms by the same, same amount. And then we have um, V M I M cos omega T theta V minus theta I times cos omega T. Okay, let's see if we can use this trigonometric identity here, cos alpha times cos beta, like I mentioned, the trigonometric identity of alpha minus beta, cosine of alpha minus beta. If I do that, I'm going to um, end up with an equation that looks like so. Power is Vm im over two, cos theta V minus theta I, plus Vm im over two, cos two omega T, plus theta V minus theta I, okay? I'm going to, um, let me take it, let me talk about the final result because it's just using this trigonometric identity. I leave it as an exercise. Cos alpha plus beta is cosine alpha times cosine beta minus sine alpha sine beta, okay? Use that trigonometric identity, okay? What we will see, is the product V times I, okay? This is what we started out with, V times I, right? That product, which represents the RMS value. So this RMS value has three terms associated with it. Let's see, let me color code them. There are three terms associated with it. That's one term right there, okay? There is another term right here, okay? And then there's a third term, which is this guy, okay? Notice that there is three, there are three terms over here. And if omega is your frequency, tell me which of these terms is independent of frequency.
there are three terms here. The first one highlighted in blue, the second one shown in green, and the third one shown in purple. Okay, this is simply a manifestation, a modified version of the V times I. V is a cosine, I is a cosine. You multiply two cosines. This is what you end up with. Okay, so take a look at these three terms. V, the first term is Vm i m over 2 cosine of theta v minus theta i. The second term shown in green is Vm i m over 2 cosine of theta v minus theta i cosine of 2 omega t. The third term is Vm i m over 2 sine theta v minus theta i sine 2 omega t. Okay, so which of these terms is independent of the frequency? Um, is it the first term? It's is, the first term. Correct, and why is that? Because there is no omega term in here. See, the second term has an omega component, so it's dependent on frequency. The third term has an omega component. It's dependent on frequency. Omega is the frequency, right? But the first term is independent of omega. There is no omega term. And therefore, the first term is independent of frequency. It's called DC, okay? It's called DC power, average power, power at DC, okay? Then there is on the second term, which is in the cosine form. The third term is called a reactive power. So this guy has a dependence on two omega. Remember, your voltage was in terms of omega t. Okay, your current was, so this was your voltage. Your current was omega t as well theta v and theta i, but your power though has dependence on two omega t, okay? Your power has dependence on two omega t. That's how trigonometric, trigonometric equations work, okay? Identities work. So there is a term that does not involve omega. There's the second term that is purely cosine, and the third term which is purely signed. This third term is called the reactive power. The third term is called the reactive power, okay? The second term, as you can see, has some components in um, two omega, just as uh, the third term does, okay? The frequency components are all in terms of um, two omega, okay? And that's what we want to remember. Questions, please, questions so far, okay? So the instantaneous power has three components to it. There's a DC power, there's a cosine power, and there's a reactive component. Okay, that's all there is to this guy. Okay, so let's look at the average and reactive power. Okay. Average power, so there are three components. Let me highlight them one more time using the exact same color coding, okay? Shown in green is this guy, okay? Which corresponds to the cosine, okay? Shown in purple is this guy, okay? This is exact copy of the equation from above which is simply a multiplication of V and R. It's a power, right? And then of course there is this guy. That this term is divide of volt, uh, uh, the frequency term, okay? The blue term is called the average power, okay? So if you notice the blue term P average, is defined as whatever is 
inside the blue term, okay? Vm im over two cosine of theta v minus theta i. That's exactly showing up here as well. So that's p average times cosine two omega t. Okay, so that's exactly what I have here. P average times cosine of omega t. And this guy, so there are some definitions here. P average is defined to be, okay, let me see if I can write it over here. P average is defined to be this guy. Okay, all of that guy, I'm going to rewrite it but in a better um, notation here, Vm, Im over two cosine theta V minus theta I, okay? Similarly, this guy, Q, okay, the reactive power is defined as Vm, Im over two sine, theta v minus theta i, okay? That's the theta v minus theta i is the difference in angles between the phase of voltage and the phase of the current, okay? So three terms, the first term is called the average term, the average power, it does not have any frequency components. There is no omega term in here. It's two omega term over there, two omega here. The second term is made up of purely cosines. The third term is made up of purely sine, okay? The sine term is called the reactive term, okay? Q is defined as the reactive power that is temporarily stored by the circuit. If you have inductors and capacitances in circuit, they also have a tendency to store the energy, okay, and power. Q is defined as the reactive power that is temporarily stored by the circuit, okay? Okay, so here is the equation that we bear in mind. The instantaneous power is average power plus average power times cosine of two, two omega t minus the reactive power q times sine of two omega t, okay? We know the definitions for sine from first principles. Theta v should be given in your equation. Theta i should be given as your, in your equation from the input current. Vm should be given in the equation from your input current. I am should be given, okay? So you can express average power and reactive power from first principles, okay? So now we can, uh, we can make further simplifications. We can look at the behavior of a purely resistive circuit. How does a purely resistive circuit behave when the input is a sinusoidal wave and the output is a sinusoidal wave, okay? The big thing we want to remember is for a resistor, okay? For a resistor, the voltage and current are in phase, okay? Remember I gave you the mnemonic. And I'm going to show it to you here. Eli the Iceman. Okay, when it comes to an inductor, voltage leads to current. When it comes to a capacitor, current leads the voltage. Okay, Eli the Iceman. That's the mnemonic I gave you. But when it comes to a resistor, both the voltage and the current are in phase. So if voltage was Vm cosine omega t, plus theta V, current would be I M cosine omega T plus theta I 
which is the same as theta v because they're in phase okay so both the voltage and current have the exact same phase for the resistor therefore um, i know for a fact that theta v minus theta i equals zero okay theta v minus theta i equals zero okay and we know cosine zero is one cosine one is zero now we can simplify this we can simplify this uh, for a resistor okay the q term disappears okay because the sine term okay the sine theta v minus theta i this term becomes zero okay and this term becomes one okay that's the idea you see the idea right so that's the um, simplification for this system for a resistor the reactive power goes to zero reactive power is the amount of power stored right so there are a bunch of different ways to remember this what is reactive power reactive power is the power stored by a circuit okay the power stored by a resistance is really zero which shows up here as q sine 2 omega t and this guy really goes to zero because q is zero okay because q goes to zero the reactive component becomes zero okay questions please questions so far okay if you don't have questions let me ask you a question okay what do you think happens for an inductor and for a capacitor when you do the power calculation what do you think happens to the inductor and what do you think happens with the capacitor that's where the um reactive power comes from is the inductor and the capacitors in the circuit yes okay that is correct the reactive power is um, associated with the with the reactive power is associated with the um, inductor and capacitor this is what is going to happen what you will see is the power in an inductive circuit is just q okay this cosine terms go to zero because in an inductor the current lacks the voltage or the voltage leads the current by 90 degrees so cosine of 90 goes to zero so any of the terms of the three terms okay of the three terms here two of them have cosine okay two of the terms have cosine remember two terms have cosines okay so these two term terms go to zero there's only one term okay there's only one term both for the capacitor and inductor okay let me show you let me show you what i mean okay for a reactive purely reactive um circuit okay for an inductor the current lacks the voltage by 90 degrees so theta v minus theta i is 90 degrees because the voltage leads the current and we know cosine of 90 is zero and sine of 90 is one okay when you do that the average power 
which is Vm Im over 2 cosine cos theta V minus theta I. This represents your average power. Okay, power average, that guy goes to zero because it's a cosine term. Cosine of 90 is zero. Okay, so both the terms that have the cosine theta V minus theta I, okay, both the terms that have this component that goes to zero, both of them go to zero, and you're left with a purely sinusoidal form. Okay, purely sinusoidal form, and notice that there is a negative sign here. Negative sign coming from the equation above. Okay, the equation, there's a negative sign innate from the equation, and that is that carries through. Okay, that carries through. So this is the power in an inductor. Okay. Power in an inductor is negative Vm Im over 2 sine theta V minus theta I. Okay, or theta V minus theta I is again, so this is, oh, this is a capacitive circuit, that's why. Okay, this is a capacitive circuit. So here is my inductor. Okay, here is the inductor, negative Q sine two omega T. Okay, where omega is your frequency. Okay, there's a negative term over there. Inductors absorb power. And then the units of power is given in volt ampere reactive. So this power is expressed in terms of volt ampere reactive. Okay, VAR. So the Q term that's uh, coming from the sinusoid for an inductor is negative because theta V minus theta I is 90 degrees and the minus that is coming from the previous original equation that carries. Okay. Similarly, when you do the power for a purely capacitive circuit, you don't even have to do the math. You can pretty much, you can pretty much guess that this is going to be positive Q sine two omega T because all the cosine terms go to zero. Okay, let's see, all the cosine terms go to zero. Cosine terms of negative 90 is zero. Similarly, sine of negative 90 is negative one. Because remember Eli the Iceman? Eli the Iceman, current leads the voltage by 90 degrees in a capacitor, okay? So the voltage phase minus the current phase is going to be negative 90 degrees, okay? Negative 90 degrees. So the bottom line is that uh, for a capacitor, the power is Q times sine two omega T, two omega T, okay? Q is, uh, positive, okay? Capacitors, therefore, deliver power. The units of reactive power are again in voltage ampere reactor. Okay, so the bottom line is, let me see if I can add a page here. Okay, the instantaneous power is P average plus P average times cosine two omega T plus Q 
times sin 2 omega t. Okay, that's the that's the definition for the power. Okay, where p average is defined as vm im over 2 cosine of theta v minus theta i. Okay, theta v minus theta i. Similarly, Q is defined as Vm Im over 2 sine theta V minus theta I. Okay, so if it's a resistive, purely resistive circuit, a purely resistive circuit has just that guy as the power. Okay, similarly, did I did I get something wrong over here? I got one of the terms wrong. Which term did I mess up on? Take a minute to see the mistake that I may have done. <laughs> Should actually be negative Q. Oh, negative Q. Yeah. P average is negative Q times sine two omega t. Okay, so that's it. Now, for a resistive circuit. The power, instantaneous power is going to be just this guy, okay? Because the Q term goes to zero, theta V minus theta I goes to zero. So the sine component goes to zero. Similarly, for a purely inductive circuit, the power is just this guy, okay? For a purely inductive circuit, the power is just that guy, okay? For a purely capacitive circuit, the power is positive Q sine two omega T. Okay? For a purely capacitive circuit, negative Q sine two omega T for a purely inductive circuit, P average plus P average times cosine two omega T for a purely resistive circuit. And then here I have a resistive circuit, purely resistive. Is average power, okay? Plus average power times cosine two omega t. So by looking at this guy, the sign of the power, you can identify whether the circuit is a capacitive circuit or whether the circuit is a, an inductive circuit. Okay, question for you. Okay. In determining the overall behavior of the circuit, whether it is a purely capacitive or purely inductive circuit, which term plays an important role. The angle. Say that again. The angle. The angle. Thank you. Which angle specifically? Uh, the angle is correct. So the angle theta v minus theta r is an important angle because if this guy is positive. Okay, Q turns out to be positive. Okay, 
which is an inductor, okay? No, it, which is, Q turns out to be positive and the overall current turns out to be negative, which is an inductor, okay? So if this guy is negative, theta V minus theta is negative, then Q turns out to be negative, and then you have negative times negative, which gives you a positive, okay? So the idea being this angle, what you said is right, this angle, theta V minus theta I is of utmost importance. This determines if the circuit is leading, if the voltage is leading the current or lagging the current, okay? And based on that, we have a purely inductive or purely capacitive or something in between, okay? So the idea is this angle, theta V minus theta I, is very, very important in determining the sign, okay, the polarity of the reactive power. So this is the reactive power, right? This is the reactive power, okay? This reactive power, the sign of that, the polarity of that, is determined by the angle theta V minus theta I. So it's an important parameter, so much so that we like to call this guy as the power factor, okay? Cosine of theta V minus theta I is defined as the power factor. Sinusoidal, um, uh, and then this guy is called the reactive factor, okay? Sinusoid of theta V minus theta I is called reactive um, power factor, okay, reactive factor. And theta V minus theta I is also identified as a, an important parameter, okay? I'll give you the name of that uh, parameter shortly, okay? Theta V minus theta I also has a definition, okay? I define that to be some um, term, okay? But what we want to understand is, cosine of theta V minus theta I is defined as power factor. Sine of theta V minus theta I is defined as the reactive factor, okay? Now, we can do some simple problems. V is given, Vm, cosine omega t plus theta V is given, this is theta V. Theta I is given to be negative 15 degrees. Theta I is given to be negative 15 degrees. Then uh, we have to find the power factor, okay? Which is cosine theta V minus theta I, okay? How do we find the power factor, okay? We, we want to put both the voltage and current into a common form. So this is not theta I quite, because notice that it is in sinusoid form. So I want to convert it to a cosine, okay? So I'm going to modify I to take a cosine form rather than a sinusoidal form, okay? I can use the trigonometric identity that cos theta minus 90 is sine theta, okay? So from that, we have the idea that, uh, see that this guy is theta i. The theta i is negative 105 degrees, okay? So I cannot use this as theta i directly because it's in its sinusoidal form. We want to put both of them in a common form, preferably cosine, okay? Now the power factor is cosine of theta V minus theta I. Theta V is 15, theta I is negative 105. So cosine of that is cosine 120 degrees, negative, negative value 
for your reactive power indicates in an in inductive circuit. So this is uh, no, this is lagging. This is this is just lagging. So the average power, okay, doesn't still indicate a um, an inductive circuit. So the average power is you can calculate the average power v m i m over two cos theta v minus theta i, which is going to be negative one hundred watts. Okay, you see that the circuit is delivering power to the load. Okay, the circuit is delivering power. Okay, we can also calculate the reactive power for the exact same V and I. Okay, the reactive power is Vm Im over two sine theta V minus theta I, which is going to be 173 reactive. Okay, so Vm Im over two sine theta V minus theta I. So we see that the network is absorbing VARs, the network is absorbing um, voltage amplitude reactor, which indicates an inductive network as indicated by the lagging power factor. Okay, the lagging power factor, see? Theta V minus theta I is positive, okay? Theta V minus theta I is positive, it's a lagging power factor. Okay. Okay. Now let's see. So um, all I have done is to simply calculate the value of theta v. I didn't even calculate. It was given to be 15 degrees. Arrive at the value for theta i, which was negative 105 degrees. Then it's just a matter of cosine theta v minus theta i vm im over two. That gives me the average power. That gives me the average power. Okay, the average power is given by that guy. Okay, similarly, if I do the exact same thing, but with sinusoid, sign, then I have, um, reactive power, okay? A simple idea. It's, it just comes down to finding this important parameter, theta V minus theta I. Once I have theta V minus theta I, it's easy to do the, it's easy to do the reactive power and average power calculations, okay? Let me see if I can clean this up a bit. Have a tendency to overmark my circuits. Okay, that's theta i. Okay, that's theta i. Power factor is cosine v minus cosine i. Cosine theta v minus theta i. Let's see. We can do the RMS power calculations, the RMS value. When we do the RMS value, by using the root mean squared, we find the mean by doing integration squared. And that is some notion of a mean, not quite the mean, but uh, you square the function, generate a continuous sum, which is integral over a time period, divided by that time period to get a the squared the squared um, integral over time. And then take the square root, you have RMS value. Okay, so the average power is uh, simply, okay, V squared RMS by R. Okay, power average is V squared by R or I squared R. So when you're doing power average calculation, you can simply do V RMS squared, root mean squared over R, or average power 
can also be calculated as I squared times R. And this I has to be RMS current. I RMS times R. Okay. And we know the definition for VRMS. VRMS is V peak or V maximum over square root of two. Okay. So the RMS value is also often called the effective value. RMS value is called the effective value. So what you can do is the average power in terms of the effective value is V times I V M I M over two cos theta V minus theta I. So I'm going to write it as V M over square root of two, I M of square root of two, because square root of two times square root of two is two in the denominator. It's simply, it's simply breaking this term V M I M over two into two components that you know. Okay, so what you're going to do is V RMS times I RMS times cos theta V minus theta I is called the average power. By the same token, sine theta V minus theta I times V RMS I RMS, everything else is the same, only the cosine changes to a sine when you're calculating the reactive power, okay? So this term, theta V minus theta I, is an important term, as you can see, okay? This term, theta V minus theta I, is an important term. What is the average power delivered to the resistor? The average power delivered in this case is V squared RMS over two, so Vm, over root two is the RMS voltage. That squared gives you V RMS squared over, over R, V squared over R. Gives you the power, okay? So it's easy to calculate the power, V squared over R. Except for V, we use the average or the, not the average, but the RMS power. Okay. Root mean squared power. Similarly, there is a complex power. So you have power average, okay? And then you have Q. If you express that as a complex number, that gives you a complex power. Very simple idea. That's why I said this chapter is very easy, okay? So the complex power is simply P plus JQ, okay? P plus JQ. The complex power is the sum of real and reactive power, okay? Sum of real and reactive power, okay? This term, theta V minus theta I is defined, I call it as theta, okay? So cosine of theta V minus theta I plus J sine theta V minus theta I S is called the um, reactive, is called the complex power, okay? So very, very simple idea, S angle theta, when you express it in rectangular form, S cosine theta, J S sine theta. Okay, so you can call this as a real part of S is P. The imaginary part of S is called uh, Q. Okay, now the apparent power is defined as the magnitude of complex power. The magnitude, when you look at the complex power and then take the magnitude of this guy, that's called the apparent power, the apparent power. Okay. P is defined as S cosine of theta 
Q is defined as the magnitude of S sine of theta. Okay. Finally, we come to a point where theta defined as theta B minus theta I. We are ready to give it a name and define it. Okay. okay. We are ready to define it. Okay. Whereas S is defined as the apparent power. S is defined as the apparent power, which is the magnitude of the complex power. It's the magnitude of complex power. Okay. So um, here is an example. An electric load operates at 240 V RMS. Okay. The load absorbs an average power of 8 kilowatts lagging with a power factor of 0 0.8. So cosine okay, of theta v minus theta i is given. And then the average power is given, the RMS is given. Okay, the average and then cosine of theta v minus theta i is given. So V RMS is given to be 240. P average is given to be 8 kilowatts. Okay. And cosine of theta V minus theta I is given to be 0 0.8. Okay. This guy is given to be 0 0.8. Okay. Calculate the complex power of the load. Okay, let's see if we can put this. We, if we can put these concepts, make them more concrete by putting them into an example. Okay, this is given to be a lagging power factor, which means that the current lags the voltage. Lagging power factor means the current lags the voltage which implies an inductive load. See, it's mentioned a lagging power factor that's mentioned. Lagging means current lags the voltage. Okay, current lags the voltage. I lags the voltage. Okay, and that happens only in inductive E lie. Remember, voltage leads the current a current lags the voltage in an inductor. So that is, so that is lagging power factor means inductor. Okay, now um, once we have that, once this is an inductive load, theta V minus theta I is positive because it is an inductor, right? Theta V um, is positive. Theta V minus theta I is positive in an inductor, okay? Current lags the voltage or the voltage leads the current. Voltage leads the current, okay? So theta V minus theta I is positive. And then we have P is modulus of S cosine of theta. Okay, um, what is P? P is the average power. Remember, P is the average power. Let me go back. Okay, P is the average power. Okay, P is the average power. Average power is P. Okay, that average power is given to be 8,000. So this is P average, this is P average actually, P average, which is defined as P. P is given to be eight kilowatts. So we should be able to find the value of S, the magnitude of S, okay? We have to, we can find the magnitude of S, okay? Which is given to be um, P over cosine theta, which comes out to be 10,000 
10,000 volt amperes. Okay, 10,000 volt amperes. Also, we can find the power factor angle. So this theta V minus theta I is defined as the power factor. angle cosine of this power factor angle is defined as the power factor sine of this power factor angle is defined as the reactive factor okay so from this power factor power factor is given to be so in other words cos theta v minus theta i is given i should be able to calculate theta v minus theta i okay theta v minus theta i which is theta is cosine inverse of of 0.8, which is 36.87 degrees. So I should be able to calculate the sinusoid of that, sine sin of it, which is 0 0.6. So from that, I should be able to calculate the reactive power, which is modulus S sine theta. Modulus S has been found to be 10 kilowatt, 10 kilovolt ampere. And sine theta is found to be 0 0.6. So it's a simple problem that comes down to calculating the value of average power and modulus of S. Okay, once you have the modulus of S, you should be able to calculate the reactive power factor and then the overall complex power okay j p plus j q p plus j q okay eight plus j six kilowatt kilovolt amperes okay so on and so forth then you can do the different power calculations okay power is vm i p is vm i m over two cos theta v minus theta i q is vm i m over two sine theta v minus theta i then we can have the complex power to be p plus jq okay there are very very simple very very simple um applications here okay the powers can be expressed as um i squared effective times r, i squared r and then uh, s can be expressed as I squared effective times Z, okay? So on and so forth, okay? So here is an example. The, the same example, as a matter of fact, the same currents and the voltages, okay? We have to calculate the complex power. How do we calculate the complex power, okay? Complex power is easy to calculate. We first simply um, V times I, okay? V is uh, 100 cosine omega T plus 15. I is um, omega T negative 105 degrees. Okay, the phasor form of the input, so V, Alex, v is expressed in 100 angle 15, I is expressed as four angle negative 105, okay? And then we have the um, conjugate of this guy, complex conjugate, a four angle 105 degrees, okay? The complex power, okay? The complex power can be expressed as half, one half V I term. Okay, one half um, VI, where if you remember, the S term can be expressed as V effective times I star, which is the complex conjugate. I'm ex using that equation here, that idea here, one half V times I star, which is the complex conjugate, okay? Of uh, of the current, okay. The S, the complex power, the magnitude can be calculated using S. Once I have S, which is which comes out to be two hundred, and the angle to be one twenty, 
I can express it in a complex number format. Can I can express this in a complex number format. Okay, and then the maximum power transfer theorem, of course, applies in uh, in uh, the complex uh, domain as well, in the uh, frequency domain as well. The idea being for the maximum amount of power to be transferred from this voltage source to the load, we want to make sure that the impedances ZTH and ZL, Z load or ZL, we want to make sure that they are matching. That's all there is to it, okay? Let's see. So um, after this analysis, what you will see is the result that is important to us that the, um, Z, when ZTH equals to ZL, maximum power transfer occurs, okay? Okay, the maximum power transfer occurs when ZL is equals to the complex conjugate of the, of the seven ends equivalent of the, of the circuit, okay? When ZL equals to the ZTH complex conjugate, that is when the maximum power transfer occurs, okay? And the maximum power, so the maximum power is V squared M over 8RL, okay? That's the maximum amount of power that occurs. That can be transferred to a system, to a, an impedance ZL load, okay? You have to match the load ZL to the complex conjugate of the Thevenin's equivalent. Okay, so that's the idea of maximum power transfer. Um, so let me see if I can quickly go back and summarize any concepts, um, review any of the concepts. Okay, the big picture overview again in a couple of minutes, in three or four minutes. Okay, when you're doing power con calculations in uh, sinusoidal steady state analysis, you talk about what is known as the average power, reactive power, complex power, and apparent power, okay? The um, voltage is given as cosine of theta V. Current is given with a phase angle of theta I. We see that the instantaneous power, the product of V and I has three terms. There's a D DC term shown in blue, which is purely independent of omega. There is no omega term. And there is a cosine term shown in green. And there is a sine term shown in purple. The sine term is called the reactive power, okay? So um, we saw the reactive power, power at two times omega, okay? We defined average power to be Vm times Im over two cos theta V minus theta I. Q is defined as the reactive power, which is Vm Im over two sine theta V minus theta I. What happens in a purely resistive circuit is that there's only um, average power and the cosine term. Okay, in a purely inductive circuit, there's just the Q term, okay, with a negative sign. In a purely react, in a purely capacitive circuit, you have the Q term with a positive sign, okay? This is what we discussed so far. Then we went on to talking about the importance of theta V minus theta I, okay? Theta V minus theta I, is defined as the power factor angle theta, okay? Power factor angle theta, and power factor is cosine of theta, and reactive factor is sine of theta, okay? There's a reactive factor, and there's a power factor, okay? And we did a simple problem where you're expected to find the, um, 
power factor. Power factor is simply the cosine of theta v minus theta r. Then we went on to finding the average power, which is Vm Im over 2 cos theta V minus theta I. Okay, so on and so forth. And then we found the reactive power. The active power is nothing. So we found the average power, we found the reactive power. Okay, all the terms. Okay. So when we see that the network is absorbing voltage ampere reactive. When the network is absorbing reactive power, then the circuit is inductive. When the network is delivering voltage ampere reactive, then this network is capacitive. Okay. We can make the same determination using the power factor uh, angle. If the power factor angle theta v minus theta i is positive, then um, it's an inductive circuit. If theta v minus theta i is negative, then it's a capacitive circuit. Okay, it's a capacitive circuit. That's what we discussed um, today. And then we went on to talking about RMS value and power calculations. Okay, when you're calculating power, you can see that um, we can find average power by using this guy, V RMS over, V RMS squared over R, or I squared RMS over two. Okay, similarly, um, where we know V RMS is Vm over square root of two. Okay, average power is given as V RMS, I RMS times cos theta, cosine theta. Okay, where theta is theta V minus theta I. That's the average power. The reactive power is given as V RMS, I RMS, sine theta V minus theta I. Okay, and then we did a simple problem where we found the average power. Okay, then we went on to talking about the complex power is the sum of the real and the reactive powers. Okay, there's a real part and an imaginary part. When you put them together in a complex notation, a complex number form, you have um, a, a complex power. Okay, the apparent power is defined as the magnitude of the complex power S. The p squared plus q squared under root is defined as the apparent power. Okay, this last definition leads to two useful relationships. P is modulus of apparent power times cos theta. Q is modulus of apparent power s, modulus of s times sine theta. That's apparent power times sine theta. Then we discussed um, what is lagging and what is leading. In lagging, um, current lags the voltage, meaning it's an inductive load. Voltage lags current or current leads voltage, then it's a capacitive load. Okay, simple ideas. When you know how to do um, complex number calculations. You should be able to do the power calculations. Okay, simply in order to arrive at the power, you can express it as V effective or V RMS times complex conjugate of I RMS, which is the same as V times complex conjugate of I over one half. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, so when you're calculating power directly from voltages and currents, you take the voltage 100 angle 15, you take the current 4 angle negative 105, 
find the complex conjugate of it, which is four angle positive one zero five, multiply V to I star. Okay, I star is the complex conjugate. One half of that, one half V I will give you the complex conjugate power. Okay, that's all there is to it. Maximum power transfer happens when the load Z equals to ZTH conjugate, the complex conjugate of that uh, load. Okay, questions please, questions so far. Okay, I do want to thank you um, for sticking um, sticking through the um, for for uh, uh, sitting through the course for uh, finishing the semester on a good note. Um, many congratulations! You should have picked up many useful handy techniques that will become very useful in your advanced courses. If you are an electrical engineer, computer engineer mechanical engineer, all of this will become, uh, will come in handy when you're solving electric circuits or um, mechanical circuits expressed as electric circuits, okay? When you're designing um, electric circuits, okay? So I wish you all the best for the, the final exam. And then if you have any questions before now and the final exam, you're welcome to send me an email. I know I have a couple of emails that I have to still respond to. I'll definitely get to them shortly.